All right, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of the Howie the Hops podcast. I'm Chris from Howie the Beers on Instagram, and as always, joined by David and Alex from the Hop Guys on Instagram. Today, we're joined by John and Alex from S43. So before we get um, before we get cracking into this first beer, lads, do you just want to introduce yourself and your role at the brewery? You go first, Alex. All right. Uh, yep, so I'm Alex uh, Rattray. Um I think my official title is senior craft brewer, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm just basically the brewer. So. <laughs> uh, and I'm John or JT, depending on who you're speaking to. Uh, and I basically sell beer. Um, my official job title is craft beer ambassador, but that basically means that I just sell craft beer for S43. <laughs> Nice. Well, um, right, we'll get cracking into this first beer. Does one use want to introduce it and then we'll, uh, we'll get going? Uh, yeah, so this is Yeep. Um, so this is a New England style IPA. Um, we've done uh, like a number of New Englands and I um, feel like this is like a really nice representation of the style that we kind of like to do them with. Um, I think our New Englands do have a, like a touch bit more bitterness to them than, than some do. Uh, and that's just kind of like a, I think a preferential, like just kind of how we like to brew. Um, so it has Galaxy, Citra, and Strata in it. Um, so this was like hop combo. We were really excited to try out. Um, Strata is kind of a new, newish hop that's just kind of been making the round. So we just, we were able to get a little bit uh, earlier in the year. Uh, and then I think probably everybody's very familiar with, with Citra and Galaxy as well. So um, like all kind of three interesting hops that have lots of fruitiness, but they all three kind of have this more um, kind of dank, savory, weedy quality to them as well. So we thought it would probably work pretty well. And it's it's pretty much, you know, one third um, of each hop in the beer, you know, roughly. Um, so it's, it's been double dry hopped, um, obviously a lot of kind of world, late whirlpool additions, like no raw hops in the kettle or anything. And then just a pretty basic, um, malt bill of Maris Otter, uh, oats and wheat. So I, I like to use Maris Otter in, uh, some hazy stuff. Um, I think there's some thinking that you want to use maybe a lighter malt, but, uh, I just think the Maris Otter gives it like just a little bit of extra kind of rounded malt flavor for lack of a better better description but um yeah so it's 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 fairly thick and i think it's just a really cool balance of like weird you get some like passion fruit and and some maybe some like citrusy melon and then you also get this really kind of savory um i think dank's a pretty good pretty good descriptor of it um so yeah yeah uh, it's <laughs> also oh, sorry chris no go on, i was just saying it tastes absolutely lush <laughs> uh, it's also worth uh, saying we did a beer last October called Pink Chimneys, which was just Galaxy and Citra. Um, would you say it was a pretty similar malt bill as well, Alex? Yeah, it's a prim almost exact, actually. Yeah, and so obviously, I think it's, it's really interesting. I'm guessing, Chris, you'll definitely have drank it, because I think you drink every beer we bring out. <laughs> um, but I think that it's really nice to see how like just the addition of Strata has made this beer like more well, because I think Pink Chimneys, while it was nice, kind of it, it was i don't know it, it just this just has a more well-rounded flavor like it, it's got a nice hop it's got like a nice hop flavor it's still sweet and it's got a really nice bitterness and i think it's just a bit more three-dimensional than pink chimneys was which i still love pink chimneys but this is just like a little bit better than me like an like an amped up version isn't it mm -hmm, yeah. pretty much but it's um when you're drinking that you wouldn't the body and the flavors and that you wouldn't think it was like 6.4 percent you know it's not it's not a massive abv but that, mm -hmm. that drinks in a good way above like the body wise and, and flavors drink above the abv which is uh, uh, uh the, the hop combo excited me when i saw you had brought it out as well so i'm glad we're uh, <laughs> i'm glad we got to try it on here because it's yeah it's banging that like that's what do you think you're enjoying it yeah, it's good you get that kind of the punchy fruit up front, like you said, like that sort of passion fruit. Um, and then that real punchy bitterness at the end uh, gives it a real nice crisp for me. Uh, I'm not usually a big fan of overly bitter beers, but I think it works quite well with that kind of that sweet fruitiness up front. It kind of, like, kind of, yeah, all sorts going on in the mouth at once. <laughs> the pillowy softness at the end as well is really nice. It helps with that bitterness and carries it nicely through. So there's no kind of like, I, I think we're, kind of great saying like 
the bitterness sometimes really over, overpowers and you can taste it long on, but it's got like a nice kind of segue with it, if that makes sense, which makes it mm -hmm. super, super drinkable. Like that might not be lasting too long in my glass. <laughs> I think the bitterness makes it like, uh, like I can compliment our beers probably a bit better than that kind of, because I don't actually make the beer, so I'm not like tooting my own horn. <laughs> but like, uh, I think the bitterness in this one just really like it makes it very Moorish. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like you'd hope that the weather's going to get nicer over the next few months. Um, and I just think this would be a really nice beer to sit outside on a warm day. Um, yeah, it's just refreshing and nice. The bitterness is that thing that always draws you back in for like another kind of sip, doesn't it? There's been quite a few that we've had in the past which are nice, but they're a bit too kind of sweet and there's nothing kind of right bringing it back down to earth, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas, like what you say, like it doesn't, it does make it a bit more like Moorish for it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's like, uh, you know, a lot of us, you know, breweries where like we're brewing a lot of the same kind of styles, you know, all these hazy beers and stuff. Um, but there's lots of different kinds of ways to make them, and I think you know one of the things we like to do is because uh, I, you know, I grew up drinking and making like really bitter West Coast, you know, hundred plus IBU beers, and so um, I think bringing a little bit of that into some of the hazy stuff. And, and the other thing is um, I really like lower carbonation, especially with IPAs, like with hazy IPAs. Um, so we carve like quite low when it comes to those, uh, which can be a bit tricky. But I think if you don't have that bitterness in there and then you get that really low carb, it, it just, yeah, I think you need one or the other. Like if, you're, if you have a, a sweeter New England, it needs a bit more carbonation, I think, just to carry it. Otherwise, it's real flabby. Um, but I think you can also accomplish that with just having a li little bit extra bitterness in there. Because um, I don't like a real fizzy carb New England because it, it just ruins the texture for me. Like I want that nice, you know, pillowy, soft, kind of smooth. And I think if you start upping the carb, it, it kind of, it just makes it a little bit thinner and just – a bit more tingly which is i think that's kind of counterintuitive like when you're drinking like if you think about drinking juice like you don't drink carbonated juice typically i don't know maybe some weirdos do but um <laughs> you know like so it's, you want almost like not still but you, you definitely want it on the lower end but i think having that extra bit it just helps keep it um from being like too just flabby i guess so you say you're used to doing like more west coast and high high bitterness is is that kind of from your kind of brewing past like where, where have you kind of come from how did you get to this point yeah so um so i'm from the states obviously you can't tell um but uh and i've been brewing for a while most of my brewing experience was all over in the states and that's um you know very hoppy bitter ipas is, is kind of just the norm so i think it's kind of weird um you know being here in the uk i think if you're on the if you're into craft like you're into hazy stuff like that's just kind of the accepted thing whereas in the u.s um there's certainly that it's a huge niche uh, and obviously you would know probably breweries like monkish or, or treehouse that have like made their name by making this hazy stuff but i think what's different there is like that's a fairly small number of breweries that do it that way whereas i think here most of the craft breweries are, are kind of making their way uh you know if you think about like daya and cloudwater and wylam and like they're making their their living with doing the hazy stuff Whereas that's still a bit more niche in the States, I think. And so like typically I, I tell the guys all the time, if you walked into a, you know, a bar, uh, craft beer place or whatever, and if you ordered an IPA, if you just didn't look and just ordered it, like you're going to get probably a West Coast IPA. Like it's still going to be clear and if it, and if, and it may still be hazy, but again, it's, it's not going to be like the, the chunky opaque orange juice looking IPA most of the time. Not like those aren't super popular as well. But I think it's just a bit more, I think because the craft beer market in the States is, is so much bigger, it's just got a, it's, it's got more layers to it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think here, it's still very top, you know, top heavy. I think everybody, you know, everybody wants to be on the edge of the cutting edge, which is all these like, you know, crazy, heavily hot beers. So I think a lot of that just comes from, yeah, my experience being in the States. Um, but, uh, and I think too, and you know, hazy stuff, generally you want to drink it as fresh as possible. And, you know, in the States, if you're sending beer, you know, it's, it's a continent. So if you're sending beer all over the place, they're not the most shelf-stable beers. Um, so most of the places that do really hazy stuff, it tends to be like they sell them a lot more locally. You're not trying to ship it, you know, halfway across the, across the country. Like Treehouse and Monkish, they're really small breweries. Like the only way you can get their stuff is you have to basically know somebody that goes there and then you have to trade it online kind of a thing. So. Mm. 
So obviously, what, what is your, um, I suppose, what's your journey to S43 then, Alex? Obviously, with being from the States, what led you to, what led you to beautiful Durham? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so the brewery's in a village called Coxo, um, which uh, surprisingly I'd never heard of uh, living in Texas. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, you know, I've been brewing for a while in the States and um, I think, yeah, my wife and I were really just kind of ready for a change. And so I started looking at uh, moving and looked at a lot of different places in the States, uh, like Colorado and some things. And, um, you know, just there wasn't anything that really took us. Uh, and we, we'd been over to the UK a few years ago for a, a nice holiday. We'd like floated into Edinburgh, we got to Isle of Skye and kind of went all down the south, but kind of stayed away from most of the big cities and just did a lot of kind of rural stuff. And we just really kind of fell in love with it. And um, I think we were just getting a little bit older, ready for like a little slower pace of life. San Antonio, where we're from, it's a pretty big city. It's about 2 million people. Um, and uh, it's very spread out, but it was just starting to feel like a bit. We lived in downtown and yeah, I think we had loved it, but I think we were just ready for something different. Um, and I really enjoyed cask beer, so I was really intrigued to like kind of learning that side of things and getting to drink cask. Uh, and then at the, obviously at the same time, craft beer is exploding here. And so I think my CV um, was possibly more attractive to a UK brewery because of the experience I had, whereas I fit in just maybe it wasn't quite as special, you know, just in the normal kind of US brewery size. So um, yeah, so I, I just started looking for jobs really in the UK and I had to go through the whole use of visa process. Um, and at the time we were known as Sonic 43 back then, uh, the founder was wanting to kind of get more into craft. It had just been really traditional cask. Um, and yeah, I just, I found the job advert on the indeed and sent in a really long cover letter. Um, and, uh, it, yeah, it seemed to spark interest and we had a couple of, of uh, Skype calls and, um, a very laborious six months later of filling out paperwork and um, visa and stuff. And then, yeah, we, we got here October of uh, 2018. So. That's I was going to say, what's, what's the kind of, because is there much kind of craft, uh, sorry, cask scene that you'd worked with before? Because obviously it's a lot different, I would imagine, to... Yeah, it's, to, it's to very different. Craft. So the only ex real experience I'd had was what I think most people in this, well, most brewers in the, in the States experience would be is like, you brew a normal beer and then you like pull off one cask of it to serve in your tap room. And a lot of times you just fill the cask with weird crap. You put, you know, we would do a stout and we'd fill it with vanilla beans and cocoa nibs and stuff. Um, you know, so that was to the most of my extent was doing like a handful of casks, just kind of man, but not brewing specifically for that, just taking a beer that we would normally make. Uh, and then usually just throwing some stuff in the cask and serving it. So it's, it's, you really don't see cask at all in the States unless it's at like a, a brewery festival or something. But again, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's like a single cask that someone's taken and added stuff to you typically. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very different, um, different style. Yeah. Cause I know I, I, I used to drink, I've drunk Sonnet 43 for a long time when it was just, well, when it was mainly cask and stuff. So what, how's that transition been to kind of being I mean I don't know is more craft concentrated now would you say I know you've um you know you've been putting some cask stuff back out now the pubs are reopening and stuff but how's that transition been from the kind of real ale Sonic 43 to the craft BRS 43 maybe uh, JT can probably give you some good I mean when I first started which was February 2020 um i think we were about 70 percent cask and 30 percent craft so we were putting out like alex had been there since june or july 2019 you, you maybe end of, end of 2018 but we didn't start brewing our first craft really wasn't brewed until the spring of 2019 so mm. so at, at that point uh, we were putting out two craft beers a month um and that was like very small quantities i think it was like five layers of cans and a few kegs and just getting them out in the northeast um and then when i joined was obviously like they didn't really have anyone to just sell craft beer so i was kind of brought on to try and expand the craft and then we got locked down um and that was literally the reason why we are now a craft predominant brewery because we couldn't sell cask we were very fortunate in the fact that we put out 
Dank Money on the March before, like it was literally the Thursday before the lockdown, um, put it out and the few people that got it just raved about it on Instagram. Um, and then all of a sudden, like everything happened with the lockdown, everyone got put on furlough and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, like we just had this demand for beer that we hadn't had. And there was just bottle shops getting in touch with us. There was people trying to buy our beers online. And it just went from like naught to 100 very quickly. Um, I think it also helped that a lot of the other big breweries had either stopped selling the bottle shops, were only selling direct or kind of not closed the doors, but they kind of, they, they just went away a little bit. Um, and we were quite accessible. Um, and we were also put like, we put out Dank Money, then we put out Juice Cannon, Greenstone, we did the one we can't talk about. Um, then we did uh, the Dank Night. It was just we, like there was a lot of very good beers came out in succession of each other in the time when a lot more people were trying new beer than I think ever were before. Um, and then when everything reopened back up, like last July, it was just a no brainer where we we're like, well, that's it now. We're a craft brewery. Um, that is where, like, you make uh, we uh, Alex Alex you prefer casks to craft beer to a degree almost which is really funny for a guy who like is an expert at brewing craft beer prefers like traditional cask beer but I think like that is where we get the most excited um, and I think that's where obviously there's a trend in it I think it would be nice to see if cask kind of went the same way as craft and like it wasn't necessarily you had to have clear beers all the time that were super filtered and you know all, all this kind of stuff and you could start being a bit more experimental with cask because i think that would be a really interesting way for it to go but for the time being the thing that excites us is the craft beer um and like as weird as it is to say we do have lockdown to thank for that i think if we had didn't have lockdown we probably would have just still been putting out maybe a little bit more craft beer but the cask beer was doing perfectly fine without lockdown so we would have just carried on doing that yeah it's like it's almost forced you into it hasn't it in a, yeah. in a good way and it's yeah that, that makes sense it was it was a, it's a really weird one it was like we were forced into it we were very lucky because we got we put out some really nice beers that got some really good attention um and yeah i guess like a lot of people <laughs> were drinking last year <laughs> um, yeah, i think that was part of it i mean it's like a lot of people weren't working and then all of a sudden you've got like some money and you're like oh what should i do i guess i'll just like google or go on instagram and and find some new beers to try and, and that was the other thing we launched our web shop essentially the week i think of lockdown we'd never mm -hmm. I think we actually had a web shop, but no one had actually probably purchased anything from it. And we, we had a bunch of cans and we had just done a, a canning run right before the lockdown. And um, so we're like, all right, let's just throw the beers up on the web shop. Maybe we can sell a few of them. And we, we put them up fairly cheaply um, and like they just flew out. Uh, and so I think that a bunch of people were, you know, it's a lot easier to get somebody to take a, a flyer on your beer when it's you know four when when it's four pounds a can instead of seven pounds a can or something, so I think there was just kind of a, a perfect storm of, of people looking for some stuff to do at home, and it's like, hey, let's drink some different beers we haven't tried, um, and we we put them up for you know approachable price. Um, so yeah, it, it it was a it's the lockdowns caused lots of issues, but that it has allowed us to focus on I think ultimately what we what we do best. Um, so I think the nice thing about craft is. There's not really any limitations. You know, people are willing to pay for it. So we can use like crazy ingredients and really expensive hops. Uh, you know, as much as I love cask, the market tends to, there's just a ceiling on everything. And there's just a price point that people aren't willing to pay for it, uh, which is kind of a shame. But, you know, with craft, there's just not that barrier. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's absolutely no secret. And I think me and the lads have spoke about this before. It's no secret that craft beer is an expensive hobby. You know, if I... <laughs> that's the route you want to go down your, your bank balance does take a hit but there's there's some breweries who charge like an absolute fortune for, for a can of beer whereas like when you're talking there about an approachable price I think you guys are still an approachable price brewery where you know 
you don't have that many palpitation when you look at the price tag on the can, <laughs> even though you're still going to buy it, you know what I mean? But, yeah. How do we even jump in and say something like that? Yeah, um, it's something I asked uh, a couple of podcasts ago, and it was, do you think people's tastes now are a bit more solely into, into this sort of craft world? Are you seeing that kind of um, filter through into like the on-trade stuff now, or bars asking for more kind of cans to have rather mm -hmm. than just having like the, the same old kind of draft lines and, and, and stuff like that i mean i like i'm sure you won't mind me saying this but there's a beer street in newcastle um before the first lockdown he was a predominantly cask pub uh, i think he had four or five cask lines and maybe mm -hmm. two craft lines and now i don't know whether he's buying cask again uh, he's got six craft lines. He's got three fridges that are full of cans. Um, and I think a lot of the like the micro pubs that have been forced to adapt and change uh, over the lockdowns um, have realised actually like th this is just a bit more exciting. Um, the way like I, I don't want to bore everyone with the details, but like the way you sell crafts a lot different to cask, like cask a lot of sales is, is just you phone people up and you say, Oh, we've got these casks, how much do they cost? What's the cask? Is it a blonde? Is it a is it a copper? Um I've I've got this space in my cellar for this cask, so I'll take it kind of thing. Whereas when you ring someone up about oh craft beer or send an email, it's like what hops are in it? What have you done to the beer to make it special? Like it, it's just a lot more exciting. I think the people who were working behind the bars have found, like find it a lot more exciting as well um because they can actually talk about beer and i think like the customer like the customer bases are going to change um i know there's a lot of talk about like supermarket beers and stuff like that but all that is going to do is going to open more people up to a wider range of craft beer um it's a it's a gateway drug really like you can go into tesco and buy a three pound can of cloud water and go this I've never had anything like this before. I want to try more. Um, and like someone had to do it at the end of the day. There's other breweries that have already made the jump. Um, but obviously Cloudwater have been the most high profile one. But someone had to do it. If anything, supermarkets might start cold chain and being so that kind of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything to that. I've brought, I've brought no, everyone in there. It, it's uh, everything serves a purpose. Uh, you can ask Alex if you go into any like grocery store in america they will have a fridge the size of the whole stellar aisle in tesco full and it, it's completely refrigerated and it's got more craft beer than you can probably get in most bottle shops in the uk um and, and there's people in them supermarkets whose job it is just to go and find craft beer and buy the craft beer and if anything america's anything to follow which england seems to be trying to do I, I would give it a few years and I think things might actually be in that level. There'll always be a space for bottle shops because there's always a need for that like really booty special beer. But I don't know, there's no reason why you more be, more breweries won't be getting their core more affordable beers into places like that. Yeah. But that's the that's the lid back on the can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, on that note, who's ready for the next beer? <laughs> Yeah, yeah so, before I get started, I think we best. <laughs> What's uh, you just have you just just have your own episode, just have a proper <laughs> half an hour rant to yourself. <laughs> I think that happened on the end of the last. Oh no, it was off. It was off. off there, wasn't it? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it went boring. Went out. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to move on to the pineapple upside down milkshake IPA. Yes. Yeah. Does someone want to introduce this one? Uh, yeah, so we did a, a bakery trilogy. Um, so we released three beers kind of as a, as a set, um, all kind of themed after desserts. Um, so this is pineapple milkshake, upside down cake thingy. Um, so we've done a couple of milkshake IPAs in the past. It's been a long time actually since we've done one. Um, but uh, so the main hop in this is Brew One, um, which again is one of those kind of relatively newer ones, but it's it tends to be very distinctly pineapple, that really nice, like fresh, chopped pineapple, um, which not a lot of hops tend to give you pineapple. Like most hops tend to be more kind of mango and, and stone fruit and things. So pineapple can be a really tricky one to, to get out of hops. So, but that's 
one of the things that makes brew one pretty interesting. Um, and then we used about 100 kilos of pineapple puree in there as well. Um, and then it's it's relatively treated kind of like a New England IPA. It's, it's got London Ale 3 yeast that was fermented. Um, not as heavily hopped because you don't want to just kill all the pineapple puree. Um, so it's not as heavily hopped, but it's still a pretty heavily dry hop beer. Um, and uh, then we add kind of what makes it milkshakey is, is the, so we add some lactose uh, during the brewing process and then we add some vanilla as well. Um, I really like lactose IPAs, even if they're not like, we do a couple of New Englands that have some lactose in them. Uh, it's a much smaller amount thing would, would go into a milkshake IPA. It's really like, if we didn't put it on the label, I don't think people would even notice that it was in there on some of the New Englands, but um, the milkshakes obviously have a decent amount of them. But uh, yeah, this gives you like a really nice kind of thick creamy texture to it. Um, and it's really just, it's, you know, we were trying to just coax as much pineapple flavor without it being just, again, just straight up pineapple juice like we still it's an ipa at the end of the day still want to be able to taste the hops um, yeah. still want to be able to know that you're drinking a beer uh, but yeah we, i think this uh, this one came out pretty well then. i think it, it, well it, it tastes exactly like a pineapple upside down but <clears throat> it does you, you've got that sweetness from like the vanilla coming through you've got almost like that maltiness brings that cake feel and like say the, the lactose that thick feel to it and there's just that undertone of that kind of sweet slightly sour pineapple and it's yeah, it's beautiful. The pineapple for me as well, it tastes like it's being cooked. So it's got a slight caramelly edge to it, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. which which really adds to the kind of authenticity of it. Yeah, just to, like, just to mirror what the lad said, I was I was going to jump in and then obviously Alex beat us to it. Um, it has got complete cake vibes and you, you do get those flavours coming through. And like you say, it's not just total pineapple juice, which is, you know, it's not meant to be and it works amazingly. I've, um, if I'm honest, I've never, I've never been the biggest fan of milkshake IPAs, but that one would completely change my mind on them because that's, uh, that's brilliant. I think it's, it's a style that is like, it's really easy to jump the shark with it and just, I mean, the, the style was made as a joke. So I, I think, um, I think it's Tired Hands Brewery in the U.S. is kind of credited with it and it was because like somebody had reviewed one of their um, hazy IPAs and it would, it said like, oh, you must've just dumped a bunch of lactose and vanilla in this and it's, it's not even beer or whatever. And so they really like brewed a beer as like a joke and they put that, I think they put that review on the label of the one that did and that kind of, <laughs> and then everybody was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So, uh, but yeah, I do think it's one of those styles that it can be really easy to overdo it with the lactose or the vanilla uh, and then not let the hops shine through. It's, it's, it's really tricky to get the balance right. Um, we've done a handful and I'm not always sure. I think we've probably, I think this is the most balanced of the ones that we've done. We've done a mango one before. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes it's either like too fruity and you can't taste the hops or, you know, the, the vanilla just gets kind of lost. So it, it can be a tricky one. Uh, you just have a lot of different components going on there. And I think pineapple is a bit of a tricky one in beer too, because I think, when you think about pineapple, you think super sweet, um, but really like fresh pineapple, typically it's, it's, it's very acidic as well. It's not just straight kind of sugar sweet. Um, and so I think that can sometimes when you use like real puree uh, in the beer, you do pick up some more of that acidity and stuff. So I think it, it's not always as sweet as you might think it would be. Yeah, it's lush. Really, really enjoying that a lot. So you guys, I mean, this is part of a series, isn't it? This, um, this pineapple one and it's with the stout that we're going to drink next and then was it, it was it, it um sweet cherry bakewell cherry, bake cherry bakewell pastry sour yeah mm -hmm. um at what because I, I mean you guys have been releasing quite um furiously over the last couple of months and there's been quite a few beers come out of uh, come out of your doors what where do you come up with all your um <laughs> next idea essentially or what would how do you decide which one you're going to brew next you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, I think it's one of the things I'm, I'm more, more proud of about the brewery. It is like an extremely collaborative process, which has its ups and its downs. Um, <laughs> it, it probably yeah. might be better if it was just <laughs> me saying, this is what we're doing or somebody else. But, um, I mean, like today, for instance, we were sitting in the office and, um, yeah, there's like, what are there, like five of us in the brewery, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we were just sitting there working on, 
we were all doing stuff on a computer and I was like, all right, let's, let's plan some of the next beers that we've got like a whiteboard. And, uh, we just will tend to throw up ideas about what one of us wants to do. Uh, you know, so we were like, all right, let's do a new England on this date. And then, so we were just like, all right, well, what kind of, you know, what hops do we want to use? And so we were talking about what are the ones that we've done recently? Like, what do we have on hop contract and stuff? And so it's, you know, it's, it's JT that's involved in that is Brad, who's our kind of our main, uh, or I don't know what Brad's title is, something with sales. Um, <laughs> like Mike is our original brewer. So Mike's been around since the, the very, very early days, like 2012. Um, and then we've got a new young guy named Sam, who's kind of um, just come on board and he's just kind of like the do all, like he helps out with sales, he helps out with packaging, uh, he helps me out with brew days. Uh, and then we've got another guy named Rob that does some driving, does some brewing, does some just shenanigans in general. But um, yeah, so it, it sounds very like kumbaya-ish, but it is like, I think everybody gets a say, which is pretty cool. Uh, now ultimately like I have to be able to put it all together. And sometimes, like, the guys will come up with ideas and be like, no, that's horrible. Like, that's not going to work. Um, but, uh, like, a lot of our beers have come up with, you know, from the guys. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's a fun uh, – it's, it's really challenging because, you know, I came from the States where um, we, would, we would do some new beers, but typically we were brewing a lot of core beers. I mean, that was just kind of like the business model. Um, and right now we're trying to release at least four new beers every single month. And that's a lot, <laughs> uh, that's a lot to like come up with new ideas and new hop combinations. And, um, and then, you know, you don't really get to test any of it out. You just brew it and, you know, hope it comes out well. So <laughs> it is a bit, um, and then that's, you know, a name you've got to come up with. And then we've got to, um, you know, kind of come up with some ideas for what the can design is going to look like. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of, we don't produce that much beer, but each brew, each beer is quite labor intensive just for, as far as everything we have to essentially do from scratch. So you've done a couple of series kind of in the past, cause I think you had the palindromic series, like, uh, mm -hmm. I think I had taco cat from that one. And yeah. obviously you've done, gone for like kind of the bakery items. Mm -hmm. Is that something that helps you with that sort of process? Are you, are you looking into doing that a bit more and, and keep going with the trilogies? Yeah. And the bakery series, we did been talking about it for a little while i don't know how it came up but it was just kind of one of them where we we're just like let's do three because so in the back end of last year say from october onwards we were releasing two beers every two weeks um and then with the intention that everything was going to open back up again uh, and then we got locked down again in november and then like as you can probably imagine, sales took a little bit of a hit. Um, so we were finding that the beers that we were double brewing were kind of taking a little bit longer to, to sell. Um, thankfully, we've managed to sell everything. Um, but we decided in January that just until things kind of got back to normal, we were just going to scale it back a little bit and we were just going to do three beers every month, um, which quickly turned it into three beers every two weeks because they were selling so quick but we decided we realized that if you do three individual beers as opposed to two one double brew and a single beer because it's a newer exciting kind of thing and you've got less of it it's easier to sell so we're like well we'll take advantage of that and do a trilogy um and i mean when it so it's if it came out in april uh we've been talking about it since like november last year um and we've got our beers planned until sep october this year alex is it now yeah, september october um obviously things are likely to change but yeah like we it just kind of made sense we do have plans for another trilogy um because we do like this has gone down really well um i think people quite like the idea that you've got Can three you tell us what it is a theme no <laughs> 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 not yet uh Brad will tell me off. <laughs> uh, we and we haven't even settled. We we know yeah, we what haven't. The, we know what the theme's going to be, but we don't really know what the specifics are going to be. So. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it like just to go with what Alex was saying earlier as well. Like we we have certain things that we know we like, um, so we really like New Zealand hops. So I might you'll find that maybe every two three months there will be some form of New Zealand beer. Um, obviously a lot of breweries use New Zealand hops, but 
you don't see them shouted about as much as they probably should be. Um, because they're amazing. Like I think some of the best tops in the world come from New Zealand. Uh, obviously, we like our New England's hazy IPAs. Um, your big stouts. We're still kind of getting the grips with sours. I think the Cherry Bakewell one was probably our least favourite of the last. Um, the Crimble Crumble that we did, we really enjoyed. So it's like, we know there's definitely work to be done there. Um, but you kind of need to balance it within the way of, we wanted brew beers that are exciting to us, but then we also don't want to be sat with a thousand cans of Saison for six months because like people really want to drink them kind of beers. But at the end of the day, like there is a lot of people who just enjoy hazy IPAs. Um, me being one, I really like that. That's what I go for in a bottle shop. Um, so I guess you just need to get the balance right. And that's yeah, kind of the- like, I'm always saying when we're planning out beers and like, all right, we need to do, you know, like they make fun of me all the time because I want to brew a Belgian golden strong. Um, and cause again, this was like a lot of like as a home brewer and stuff, you grew up, you know, you, you started brewing traditional styles. Typically there were no hazy IPAs when I was, you know, home brewing. And so, you know, you brewed Saison's and you brewed Belgian triples and quads. And cause like, that was a lot of what the exciting beers were, you know, in the States, like, you could get beers over from Belgium, which nobody was really doing that much in the States. So that was like a lot of what, and then you could do sour, you know, Belgian sours and stuff. So that was, I think what I, I grew up in, what a lot, I think a lot of the U S guys grew up, you know, brewing. Um, and, but you know, here in England, it's not quite the same. Cause it's like, well, if I want a Belgian beer, I could just get one from Belgium. Or if I want <laughs> a German beer, I can just get one from Germany. Whereas in the States, that's not quite the same, you know, availability. So uh, yeah, it's a constant battle, like wanting to push some more traditional stuff. But then we know that the sales guys, you know, they're going to ring up a bottle shop and you can tell them you've got 10 hazy IPAs and they'll be like, great, I'll take a case of each one of them. And then, oh, I also have this rye saison. They're like, eh, I don't know about that, you know. So it's just, we, we pepper them through um, on occasion. But uh, yeah, you can't really make your, li- at least we can't really make our living doing that. So. I mean, you got to think, like, how many bottle shops in the Northeast alone have an amazing selection of, like, Belgian and German beers? And it's like, you can go into, you know, Rehills, and they have an entire corner of the, the dungeon dedicated to German and Belgian beers. And it's like, why would you want to get a UK's version of that when you can get it that's been brewed by like monks in Belgium and stuff? <laughs> it's just like, yeah. No, I, I understand that. It's, there's some bottle shops, and I've seen, you know, you'll, you'll agree with this. There's some bottle shops that have that type of range where you can walk into somewhere and think, I don't know what I fancy to do, and you could pick from any style on, nearly on the planet. And then there's some where you walk in and there's, literally just you know here's the ipas and a couple of stouts isn't there mm-hmm. so it is um it's good to walk into somewhere that's got some good uh variation though because I, I like changing it i like breaking up the hairs a little bit so uh it's nice to find somewhere where it's got some uh some clear yeah, please that uh domestique's got his his fridge now he has he has mate. yeah he's uh <laughs> some belgian stuff in his belgian <laughs> fridge <laughs> um when you were talking before obviously with every with every new beer that comes out, obviously there's a, a name to think of and there's a can design, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's done in-house or outsourced, but how do you, I suppose the main one is the name. I mean, you know, the the bigger trilogy, obviously the name is what the what it's meant to taste like, I guess, but <laughs> like, yeep, where, where, where does that name come from? Where's, how do you think of your names for your other ones? Every, every which way you can think of a name of a beer. <laughs> Our, our best names usually come from just like odd conversations that happen in the brewery. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, uh, so he was what somebody, just one of the guys he meant to, uh, he meant to say, yep. Is that what? Yeah. He just meant to say, yep. And he accidentally yeah. wrote yeep. Yeah. And we thought like <laughs> a yeep, yeep, yeeper just rolls off the tongue. So <laughs> yeah. Um, like, um, we've gotten away from it a little bit. I'm, I am unabashedly a, a fan of beer pun names, which I know like some people just cannot stand, but um, we've gotten away from that a little bit. But uh, like uh, a lot of times we would just be like, all right, you know, this is the beer and we'll just literally have just kind of like 
a 15 minute session of everybody just kind of think of a, of a name for it. Um, like, uh, there's a, there's one coming up and, uh, one of the, one of the ideas was booty call. We did not use that idea, but it was just, <laughs> there's usually about 20 plus that get rejected before one, uh, finally gets settled on. But yeah, we have one particular guy at the brewery. Um, and anytime we need a beer name, it's usually just common. Like, all right, we just need to wait for Rob to say something stupid and then that'll be the beer name. <laughs> um, so that, that happens a lot, but yeah, sometimes it's, it's trying to find the good, the good puns. Um, I think JT came up with, we did a, a New Zealand IPA at the beginning of the year called Old Lang Zealand. No, that was a Rob. Oh, was that Rob? I don't yeah, Rob was Old Lang Zealand. Rob has named a lot of our beers. Yeah. <laughs> I, we have another beer coming, I guess I can say this, another beer coming out next week. Um, is it next week, Alex? Yeah, next week. Yeah, uh, called Sentient Robot Cars, um, which comes from a conversation that Rob was telling us about um, self-driving cars and the essential... Do you guys know the the real... Ro the, the tram car, like... Um, it's like a more... It's like a moral... Um, What's the word? <laughs> the way, like, if, if you pull off your hip, one person yeah. you pull off your hip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People, yeah. And essentially, like, self-driving cars are going to probably have to make that decision one day. But <laughs> apparently that also breaks the first rule of robotics, which is you can't harm humans. Mm -hmm. So, like, what will the car do in that situation? And that's where the name sentient robot cars came from. Um, and yeah, like, yeah. that generally... Just absolutely daft things. Um, I, we haven't shouted them out, but there is like there's another guy who does marketing for us um, called Alex Clark, and then there's Lex who is very patient with us and does all our labels. Um, we'll send him an idea. It, it's kind of done in house um, because Lex does work for the company, um, but he does loads of other things as well. Um, but like we'll generally say like this is an idea, this is a name. He'll come back with a can, and we'll be like, "Oh, that's awesome!" Or we'll nitpick it, and he'll be like, "Why are you being so particular?" <laughs> and it'll go back and forth for a little bit. But like, ultimately, we all want what's best for the brewery, so it's a yeah. uh, it's all fun. Yeah. <clears throat> Just rather on names. Me and Chris were talking before about how much we love the name in biscuit. Uh, that's it's like for, for a biscoff pastry start, it was it's a hell of a name and it's it's well up there with my favourite so far. Yeah. Yeah, I snuck in that pun, that was okay. It was a, <laughs> it was a fantastic name when I saw that get released. I was like, not only is that band one of my favourite from you know, when I was getting into music and all that type of stuff, but the actual fact it's a biscoff stout sounds fucking amazing as well. So. <laughs> Have you tried it yet, Chris? Sorry, mate. You tried it yet. No, it's in my fridge. I've I've got it. I just uh, I haven't got around to drinking it yet, mate. Me me fridge is jammed to the honestly. I can imagine. Yeah, the missus kind of the milk in. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. I get, I'm getting in trouble. I need to try and get through as many as I can, like. But uh, it'll be getting drunk soon, mate. Probably this weekend. That, that's such an awful problem to have. I need to get through all my beer. I know. Oh. <laughs> I know. I little problems. I was just, I was thinking today, in Biscuits, the second, like, we, we released Durst Crusher as well. Obviously, it has nothing to do with Fred Durst, but, like, <laughs> Fred Durst Crusher. We'll say, we'll say it does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Cast, it, cast it as part of a trilogy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just about to say yeah. that. Like a, it'll be like a, like a posthumous trilogy. Once they're all out, we'll let people know there was a trilogy and you missed out. <laughs> that one, I was just like, I don't know the next time we're going to brew a you know, a biscuit stout. So if we don't use this name with this, like I'm just, I'm going to feel horrible. So I just, once, because I was going, it's a collab with Rivington and we went back and forth. On, we kind of settled on, we were going to do some kind of pastry stout and we had a bunch of different kind of ideas about different, you know, desserts or biscuits or whatever. And uh, yeah, once we finally settled on the, the Biscoff thing, um, I was just like, it, it, it's like, I just, I don't know. It just like came to me and I was like, this is, this is like a divine moment of inspiration here. And we're making a, a biscuit style, we have to call it. And it's an imperial biscuit style, we have to call it a biscuit style. Yeah, I agree. I think it, uh, it fits perfectly. Now, when we're talking about stouts, do uh, is everyone ready to move on to the- Yeah, hey, that's a good segue. The Coke Why? Snowball Pastry Stout. 
I mean, I've, I'm still on my first beer, so props <laughs> to you guys <laughs> <laughs> for getting through two beers in 40 minutes, 45 minutes. It needs, needs must. We did, we did six in about an hour and 15 once. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was eventful. Yeah. <laughs> He's new to this podcasting thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a grizzled veteran now. I know how much you guys drink, so I just drink water to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that um that podcast where we did because like we didn't have a brewery on and we just sat just the three of us and just spoke about a bunch of topics on craft beer and just went through six in about yeah about an hour and fifteen and hour and twenty and we were absolutely plastered at the end right. and then we <laughs> yeah, shared yeah, then we shared a triple IP at the end just to top yeah. it off <laughs> best way to do it <laughs> well, then, lads I'll let one of you um introduce the coconut snowball pastry style. Alex, yep. the other brewery. Yep, so, uh, yeah, it's just the, the third of the pastry series, and it's probably my favorite, um, partly because I just love coconut. So um, it's definitely better uh, if it's warmed up a little bit. The coconut really starts to come out kind of the longer the beer sits out and warms up. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's 10%, um, and it's got lactose in it. It's got some vanilla in it. It's got some cocoa nibs in it. Uh, and then we used um, several weird combination of coconuts. So I put some dried coconut milk powder um, into the, the boil, which was a really strange experience because it just kind of like sat on the top of the beer for a really long time. It didn't dissolve very well. Um, and then after the fermentation was complete, um, I put in 30 kilos of toasted coconut. So it's real toasted coconut, uh, and then basically just condition the beer on that for about a week, uh, and then use a little bit of uh, like a marshmallow flavoring. Marshmallow is like almost impossible to get like the actual flavor of in, so just use like a little bit of marshmallow flavoring in that. But it's mostly the coconut I think that comes out. But um, yeah, I was really I was really happy with how this came out. I mean, it's like thick and luscious and sweet. Uh, it's it's very it, it's quite over the top as far as a pastry style goes, um, but I think it's not over the top coconut. I think because we used real coconut, it doesn't just like it's it's not like you know suntan lotion kind of experience. And I think again, the more it warms up, it's 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 coconut in balance. I think it still very much tastes like a stout. You still get some of those like chocolate and caramelly notes, uh, but then I think at the very back end, you get this just like really nice kind of warming coconut thing. So. Um, yeah, I think I think that one came out quite nice. Let's go to our resident coconut uh, guru, Chris. <laughs> so, I and let us finish before we uh, start getting the steaks and fire out and stuff. I don't <laughs> like coconut at all. Like it's a flavor that really doesn't it just it doesn't agree with my palate. But I only don't like it when it's overdone and like too in your face. If that makes sense. Whereas that, when you're saying there, you you are still getting all the stout flavours, and it's it is really really balanced. So as much as I don't like coconut, I'm really enjoying this because it's not over the top like what you were saying. Um, so yeah, no, it's for someone who doesn't like coconut, this is awesome. Like it's really really nice. So I suppose that's that's the biggest compliment I can give on it because yeah, coconut's not one of my uh, go tos, but when when it's done right, you know, it, it works because it's, like you say, it's still indulgent and, you know, quite sweet, but you've still got all the stout flavours going on and it's probably a bit of a, a sipper, if you know what I mean. You can, I mean, I couldn't drink it in the next 10 minutes, but it's uh, it's one that, yeah, I enjoy over a, over a bit of time. Lads, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think, uh, so I, I wasn't really a fan of stouts or, or darker beers uh, before Christmas. Uh, and I actually tried your guys' uh, pumpkin spice latte stout, and it just blew my mind. Um, and then I kind of slowly moved away from like the pastry stouts and started enjoying more of it, like traditional, more traditional stouts, like less sweet. Uh, and, and actually, yeah, it's kind of brought me back to that pastry stout kind of flavor because it's been like a good probably six months almost since I've had one. And it's actually feels quite refreshing and like and it's very similar to that that you can tell like the lactose gives it the same same mouthfeel and that sort of thing a little bit thicker than uh, some some other stouts and it's uh 
yeah, it's, it's not over coconut heavy. Yeah, I, I'm, I basically love coconut. I'm all, all about the, the sapper hop, uh, which, yeah, <laughs> Chris isn't such a fan of. But um, yeah, it's, again, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Sweetness really lifts it for me as well. Like it's uh, like I say, it's it's probably a, a bit of a slower slower drink, and, and I think is, that is because of a bit of this sweetness in there. But it, it really does lift it, and it can kind of taste every flavour that you need to taste as well, which makes it makes a bit of a difference because sometimes stouts are a very a bit more heavier and, and, and mask a little bit, and they need that kind of lift to 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 have the flavour. I think the people that kind of do it. Some people say well, some people say a bit overdone is that a Muslim, uh brewery with uh, dessert in the cans. For me, they're a little bit, bit too sweet and this one kind of is definitely on my level uh, of sweetness. I think it, it is absolutely spot on. I think I'm a little bit like Chris, like coconut. If I if I have eaten it, it's never a massive thing. So snowballs have never been a massive thing in my life, but I love to drink the Sabro and, and have that kind of coconutty feel. And once it's mixed in with other things, it, it does make a really good beer and I can't remember who we were talking to, but they said that this um, using stuff like coconut and as a flavouring, and also using sabro as, as a hop, it does really bring other flavours through and, and kind of holds it like a bit of a platform, which is it, it's kind of what you want from a, a hop if you if you're going to be really focusing on on a, on a big flavour coming through. And this is this is really good, really good guys. I think um, we were talking today. Um, because normally when you make a stout and you put flavours in, like um, you need to be careful that you don't get it to artificial flavouring. Because um, you, you can buy pretty much any flavour for anything online. Um, we have a bacon flavour in the office, <laughs> <laughs> which we never used in the end because it's awful. Um, like you can just buy anything you like. And I think what we, what like a lot of people have responded to is the fact that we actually we put real coconut in the beer, mm. um, and yeah, like we were talk, I was talking to Alex today and saying like, can we next time we do a stout and we put a flavour in, is it something that we can put in that we can potentially just let sit in the beer for a few days to a week and soak up the flavour and then take out? Uh, and Alex responded no because he would be the one who has to take it out of the beer and how much you put in 30 kilos of coconut Alex yeah 30 kilos of coconut when it's soaked in beer is very very Probably. heavy when you're standing on top <laughs> of a ladder on the top of the tank trying to hoist this out like some giant I mean, marlin out of a tank so. it probably weighed about 60 kilos in the yeah, end easily it soaked up a lot and like Mike had to make like a winch for Alex to get the coconut out of the beer <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. From now on, we're just going back to Dawson with little flavours of things. <laughs> Everything's going to be synthetic from that one. I mean, one thing I really need to know the answer to is what was that beer going to be with bacon flavouring? <laughs> it was the uh, Sasquatch syrup. Oh, um, okay. we, we initially wanted to make a, a maple bacon coffee stout, yeah. um, but we ended up going for a maple smoked coffee stout because, yeah, bacon and beer didn't work. <laughs> No, she's, 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 I'm sure there's got to be a candied bacon stout in there somewhere. A little bit of saltiness in there would probably work quite well. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> any, 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 way, any way to use it? Any way to use try, it? Try trying to gauge Alex's reaction. I know there's, defi there's definitely um, breweries that put either like sausage or bacon flavorings in because you see stuff like that. But yeah, I don't think trying to find something that doesn't like taste artificial you know that's always the trick with stuff like that because there's there's certain flavors that are just really hard like like trying to get a nut flavor in a beer like using actual nuts is is really really difficult um and so a lot of times you end up using you know some kind of uh, you know walnut flavoring or you know almond extract or something but a lot of times they just kind of have a fakey taste to them so there's just certain stuff that's just hard to hard to get enough of the flavor in there to make it if you're using the real stuff it's hard to get it prominent enough and i think you know rightly so if you buy a you know a coconut stout or something like you want to be able to taste that there's clearly coconut in there so i think there's yeah it's 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 a tricky thing because we i had bought some coconut flavoring as a backup in case like you know i wasn't sure again like this first time we brew this beer i've never done this before so you're just kind of guessing on like 
how much coconut can we afford to put in the beer and still sell it, you know, for uh, a reasonable price? And then is that going to be enough to give the flavor? And I wasn't really sure. Uh, but thankfully, like after a few days in the tank, we tried it and we're like, oh man, it's actually like the, the coconut flavor is coming through really strong. So yeah. didn't have to use any, any kind of flavoring or anything, which is obviously the, the, the more uh, preferred way to do it. But um, we've gotten, you know, sometimes we've done some stuff where we've used like the real thing and then people complain because it doesn't, it's not like smack you in the face, you know, strong. And it's like, well, in order to get it that way, we either have to use so much that we couldn't afford to sell the, you know, no one would be able to buy the beer because it'd be so expensive uh, or you have to use a flavoring. So, yeah, I think that to be honest with you with this stout is it, it, it doesn't taste artificial at all. You know what I mean? It, it tastes mm-hmm. like, what, like what you're saying, it tastes real. And I think that's why, you know, for me not a coconut lover it, that's why it still works for me because it doesn't taste over the top and artificial and and yeah no i understand what you're saying with that definitely you still get a lot of the kind of nice roasty yeah. boozy malt flavors from the stout i mean like the biscoff one that we've just put out as well like even if you aren't a fan of biscoff um it's got no lactose in it so it's like extra boozy um it's got a lot of like big coffee roasty flavors and the biscoff's kind of more of like an afterthought with the stout um so i, I like there's been a few people who've like who really kind of the brewery and follow us quite a lot who are like oh i can't stand biscoff and it's like yeah but i think if you like biscoff you'll be like this is amazing it tastes like biscoff but even if you don't like biscoff it's like this is just a stout that has like an afterthought of something that i'm not a fan of but you're not eating the Biscoff biscuit in itself, so. Yeah. I'll, I'll use, um, about, what did we use, 40 kilos of Biscoff, I think? Yeah, 40 kilos. Do you have to individually <laughs> unwrap every no. single Biscoff from the little pocket? Actually, no. <laughs> you so, can buy Biscoff. Yeah, so it's basically, it's like the smartest thing ever, the, the factory, whatever that makes them, all the broken cookies they just sell as like crumble. You know, it's for you to make like pie crusts and stuff with it. So yeah, yeah. Buy the, now they were packed in 750 gram bags, so we did have to open up probably I don't know 50 50 bags, uh, 60 bags, something like that, which is a bit of a pain, but um, all in the name of beer. <laughs> that sounds like my dream. I absolutely love Biscoff. Like, it's just, I can't want to wait to try that. Uh, that stout. I mean, we did try, uh, or JT tried it because uh, we took some photos with uh, some Biscoff cookies in front of the stout. And then we tried dipping the Biscoff cookies into the beer and it was, it was quite intense, but it was, it was nice. <laughs> That's, yeah, sounds good. Exactly I'll, I'll be trying that, I think. Yeah. And this is our first, like, uh, the Biscoff one is the first pastry stout we've done without lactose. Um, Cause we, uh, JT pointed out that Biscoff is vegan, which I didn't know is vegan. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, we didn't use any lactose in that. And I think, uh, really, I don't think you can really tell. Uh, I think it's still nice and it's still sweet and, and thick. Um, so yeah, I think it came out well. I think it's quite nice because it doesn't have the lactose and it doesn't have that kind of overwhelming sweetness that sometimes you can get with lactose. Um, and like, whilst I think a lot of people, when they drink a 10% stout, they don't want to taste the fact that it's like a 10% stout, but it is quite nice to be like, oh, actually, this tastes like a 10% beer. Yeah, it's a boozy one for sure. <laughs> like the, co- the coconut doesn't drink like a 10% beer and it's no. dangerous how much it doesn't drink like a 10% beer. Whereas the Biscoff, you know you're drinking something quite strong. So yeah, like you say though, sometimes you want that, don't you? Sometimes you want that. And I think especially with stouts, sometimes you want that. Yeah, this is a big, big beer. <laughs> and I kind of just see it off in one go. <laughs> Definitely. Um, should we do some... In that slides, have you got anything else you want to ask, or should we hit some quick fire questions? Good. Yeah. Yeah, let's go for it. Right. So we're going to ask just a couple of uh, quick fire and uh, quick fire questions. Sorry, and obviously we'll ask you the pair of you and just yeah. So favorite S forty three beer, Alex. Um, before last week, I would have said Old Lang Zealand, but uh, since we just did Yeep, I actually think Yeep is probably one of my favorite. Cool, John. Same. Um, if not, maybe Big Juice from last year and um, the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy from Christmas. That was, uh, I love that beer. That was a good beer. 
Um, favourite non S43 beer? Uh, Timothy Taylor's landlord on cask. Nice. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. John? Um, oh, I'm going to say Into the Haze by Dare. Okay, nice. Yeah. If, if I see that in a bottle shop and I don't really know what to get, just generally we'll get that. Um, if you had to pick one S43 beer to introduce a complete newbie um, into, well, I suppose with you guys, obviously you do cask as well, but if you had to introduce a proper newbie into beer, essentially what, what S43 beer would you give them? Um, I think I'd go with Little Juice. Uh, so it's a it's a, a really hazy pale ale, uh, but it's a very intense hazy pale ale. I'd say the exact same. Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah. It, it's like it's got enough hop characteristic where I think you could be like, oh yeah, cool. Like this is a really hoppy beer, but like it's not overly intense. It's five and a half percent, so you can you can drink it and not be pissed after <laughs> one can. <laughs> yeah. Little Juice was class, like, and I loved the can as well. The can art was just awesome. It was, <laughs> it was really good. Um, Hodge, I know you like asking this one, so I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you ask this one, bud. The question of all questions: uh, What's your favourite meal deal? Meal Anyone deal. In like, uh, explain, explain this to the American. So, if you go like. My favourite meal deal uh, is to go and try and take the absolute piss about out of Tesco and try and make as much money out of what they offer for the same price. So you could get a wrap, a posh drink and a posh crisps and it all come to the same price, even if you got the cheapest. Okay, gotcha. So it could be, could be, but it could go to McDonald's, it could go to anybody. Oh, okay. Be... Uh, so the, uh, the mega box at KFC. The mega box at KFC. Yeah. What's in a mega box? I've never had a uh, mega box. It's... You get uh, two, it's either two or three hot wings. You get two pieces of like mixed fried chicken. You get two chicken strips, fries, and then a pot of gravy. And it's like four fifty. dollars Fair. Can't go wrong with that, can you? <laughs> uh, that's a lot of food for four fifty. <laughs> I think it's also 4,500 calories. <laughs> it's worth every penny then, isn't it? Rather than on a calorie basis. Uh, I genuinely oh, can't. John was um, thinking over there. He was thinking really hard about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a hard one. Uh, We've had everything to just a packet of nuts mm -hmm. to some crazy, like, long McDonald's order. So it could be there, There's a sandwich anything. shop that uh, is nearby. Oh, Paxton's. That I think that's what his would be. Yeah, Pax, Paxton's doing an amazing vegetarian breakfast wrap, but it's not really a deal. I would subway a foot long. The new um, fake chicken thing that they brought out with drink and a cookie is like, it's, it's still not cheap. Um, I think I think Boots is probably the best one if you want to take advantage and get the best value for money where you can get like a four pound sandwich, an innocent smoothie and I don't know what the, the snack would be, but it's like something that's worth seven pounds for like three fifty. Mm. Yeah. Sounds good. Lads, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you guys on. And these two will agree it's been a long time coming to get you on because what we were going to try and do when we first started was come to the brewery. Um, but obviously with, you know, COVID and lockdowns and stuff, it just never, it never came about. So thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for listening as always. I mean, now things are back open again. We've obviously done this now, but you, you're probably more than welcome yeah. uh, to come down one day. Maybe in a I few mean, I'm sure we'll be making the visit soon. Yeah. Oh, we'll meet our Neepers. We'll come down in sessions from Neepers with you. It sounds good. <laughs> right, thank you very much, everyone. Cheers.